Good morning. Uh, three principles I want to take a look at today. We've talked about all three, but we're kind of kind of review them. I'll go through the uh, questions that are on the study guide and show you a couple other examples of these principles. The first one we looked at was Pascal's principle. Uh, you had to do questions 27 and 28 from your study guide. Here's what they say. Pascal's principle says that if you exert a pressure on an enclosed fluid, that pressure is transmitted undiminished and in all directions throughout the fluid. It works best for an incompressible fluid, which would be a liquid. So the best application of that is for a hydraulic system or something like this. So let's say I have some type of incompressible liquid in here and I push down on this piston. So that pressure P1 would be force F1 and that would be applied over the piston's area A1. That pressure <laughs> transmitted undiminished and in all directions throughout the fluid. So every place where I get <coughs> area one, I also have to get force one. So in this case, uh, P2 would be equal to F2 over area two. And since area two is four times area one, I get four times the amount of force out. So in this case, <coughs> using fluid mechanics, I would have a mechanical advantage of four. I would be getting four times the force out than the force that I put in. At what cost? I'd be getting one fourth the distance out. So if I push that down four centimeters, this one would only move up one centimeter. What you lose in force, or what you gain in force, you lose in distance, but you'll never get more work or more energy out that breaks the basic tenet of physics. So this is the, the manner in which a hydraulic system works, and it's based upon something we call Pascal's principle. If you go to the back page, this one uh, right here on uh, questions 25 through 34 in your chapter 20 study guide, uh, it deals with gases and um, Archimedes principle, continuity principle, Bernoulli's principle. So the first thing it asks, it says state Archimedes principle for air. Air is an example of a fluid. So the buoyant force acting on something that's immersed in air is equal to the weight of the air displaced by the object. You know, is there a buoyant force acting on me right now? Yes. What's the buoyant force equal to? The weight of the air that I displace. And so that's going to be equal to the volume of my body times the density of air times G. And because the density of air isn't very big, I don't displace a very big weight of air, so there's not a very big buoyant force acting on me. You know, why do you get bigger buoyant forces in liquids? Because liquids have greater densities. The volume of air displaced and the volume of water that I displace is the same, okay? but the weight of air dis I displace and the weight of water I displace is not the same. So Archimedes principle still holds true. It's just, you just don't get very big buoyant forces. Uh, 26, two balloons are inflated to the same size, one with air and one with uh, helium. Which balloon experiences the greater buoyant force? They're both going to have the same buoyant force. So if this is the air balloon, and if I can draw an equal circle, that's the helium balloon. And the buoyant force acting on both of them is going to be the same. It'd be equal to the weight of the air that uh, they displace. You know, why does the air balloon sink and the helium balloon float? It has to do with the weight of the contents inside the balloon. This one's got a smaller force to the weight because helium is less dense. This one's got a greater force to the weight because air is more dense. So these two arrows are the same, but the helium force to the weight is less. And because of that, this actually doesn't float. It's going to actually accelerate up. Um, you know, how can you get a hot air balloon to float? Well, if this is hot air, that's inside the balloon and it's displacing cold air, then the weight of the cold air displaced by the balloon is greater than the weight of the hot air that's in the balloon, which creates a net upward force, which makes the hot air balloon rise in the atmosphere. Uh, what happens to atmospheric pressure during a hurricane or a tornado? When we get storm systems moving in, atmospheric pressure drops. And it's really based upon uh, Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle tells us as the, the speed of the fluid increases, the internal pressure decreases. So if you get fast moving air currents, the atmospheric pressure is going to be diminished. You know, can people really tell when you have storm systems coming in? Yeah, they, they, they can. 
you know, if you've had a knee surgery or you've had uh, like dentistry work done and you have a hypersensitive nerve, you know, there's atmospheric pressure pushing on that nerve and then that nerve pulses. Well, what happens if you have a storm system moving in? The pressure of the gas is pushing on that nerve becomes diminished. So now instead of that nerve doing this, it does this. And the person can feel that, they can sense that. So, you know, there's actually is some credence to the idea that somebody that's got a hypersensitive area of their body can actually sense changes in the weather. It's, it's actually true. It's based upon Bernoulli's principle. Uh, question 28, when the speed of a fluid flowing in a pipe increases, what happens to the internal pressure in the liquid? It decreases. And that's really what Bernoulli's principle says. As the speed of the fluid increases, the internal pressure decreases. The converse of that has got to be true as well. If the speed of the fluid decreases, then the internal pressure has got to increase. How can we explain Bernoulli's principle in terms of law of conservation of energy? Well, if you take a look at mechanical energy, it can have kinetic energy and it can have potential energy due to its pressure. So if the particles start moving faster, they gain kinetic energy, which means they're going to lose the ability to exert a pressure. You know, if they move slower and they lose kinetic energy, then they're going to gain potential energy to exert a pressure. You know, if my hands are the particles and they're moving fast, there's fewer collisions, which means less pressure. If my hands are moving fast, they less velocity, they can exert a bigger pressure. So really, Bernoulli's principle has its roots in the law of conservation of energy. Continuity principle has its roots in the law of conservation of matter. It simply says whatever fluid is, goes in has to come back out. So if we take a look at those two things combined, let's say we did something like this. Make a little bit different than yesterday. So these are streamlines. Streamlines are areas of steady fluid flow, question 31. So we're only going to deal with streamlines. Uh, Eddie would be a disturbed streamline. So you got something that was swirling that looked like this. That would be a disturbed line. That would be an eddy. We're not doing that. Okay, we're looking at streamlines. So this would be area one. This would be area two. And this would be area three. So when it goes from area one to area two, remember the volume flow rate has got to stay the same. And the volume flow rate, the volume of water per unit time, is going to be the area times the velocity. So the area one times velocity one has to be equal to area two, velocity two, which has to be area three times velocity three. Well, what happens as it goes from here to here, area two gets small, which means velocity two has got to get big. When it in, enters into a constricted region, to get the same volume of flow through that system, hey, it's going to have to move at a faster rate. If you put your finger over the end of the hose, the volume of water going through the end of the hose has got to be the same as the hurt before it, which means if you constrict the area, the velocity is going to get bigger. That's really what the, the nozzle on the hose does. You know, you have mist and you have spray and you have power and jet and all that kind of stuff. Really what it does is it just changes the area, which changes the velocity of the water. You know, over here, the area gets big, so area three would be big, so velocity three would be small. So the volume flow rate at one and two and three are all the same. But because this area gets smaller, that velocity gets bigger. And because this area gets bigger, that velocity gets smaller. So it would be moving the slowest in three. It would be moving the fastest in two. Okay. What would happen if we looked at that in terms of pressure? Well, now we're getting out of continuity principle and we're looking at Bernoulli's principle. And here's what would happen to the pressure. When it goes from here to here, it speeds up. As the speed of the fluid increases, the internal pressure decreases. So this would have the smallest velocity, okay, but the, excuse me, this would have the fastest velocity, but the least amount of pressure. Over here, okay, the velocity decreases. And as the velocity decreases, the pressure increases. So this would have the slowest velocity and the greatest internal pressure. Everybody understand that? So fast velocity, low pressure, a slow velocity, big pressure. A applications of both of those things. Uh, one of the questions on the study guide uh, asks you about that. Um, 
let's go for a walk. I'll unplug us for a little bit here. Hopefully, I've got enough power. Uh, go over here for a second. See if I can show you an application here with the air. So I'm going to turn the air on here. Uh, this cord right here, so you can hear it coming out. See? If I do that, and I take, gotta go grab my ping pong ball. See, if I get the the ear moving out of here at a fast rate. Here's what happens. You know, if you take a look at the piece of paper that's on the desk right here, okay, if I get the air moving at a fast rate, I get something called what? And by making the air go over the top of the piece of paper at a fast rate, that makes the pressure pushing on the top less than the pressure pushing on the bottom, and that creates something called lift. And when the lift force is greater than the weight of the piece of paper, it goes up. Uh, if I do this, hey, I'm going to get the ping pong ball moving over the top. I can't explain it while the air is going on because you can't hear it. But I'm going to get fast moving air currents. Let me show it to you. What was happening was I was forcing the air, when it hits the ping pong ball, it goes up over the top, and when it goes up over the top, it moves faster. If it moves faster, that means the pressure pushing down is less than the pressure pushing up, which means you end up with a net upward pressure, so you have a net upward force. That's what we call lift. In the case of the ping pong ball, the lift force was equal to the weight of the ping pong ball, and it stayed uh, levitating. It, in effect, was an equilibrium where the lift force and the weight of the ping pong ball were equal to each other. Um, so let's go back. This back then. Uh, if you take a walk, uh, there's one other thing that I want to go through here. Uh, there was a, a number of quizzes uh, that I listed in one of the Google Docs. If you take a look at that, you can pause the video. Hey, I just want to take a look at these questions and go through them with you and see how you would do. So uh, question number one, again, it looks like this. Hey, and this should set you up then and... and put you in a pretty good spot to take the quiz that I'm going to put online. So number one says all submerged objects must displace an amount of fluid uh, equal to their own volume. So submerged objects displace an amount of fluid equal to their volume. Number two, all floating objects must displace an amount of fluid equal to their own weight. So if the buoyant force is up and the force due to weight is down and the object is floating, those two forces have to be equal. So all floating objects displace an amount of fluid equal to their weight. Okay, Archimedes' principle states the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So number three would be weight. Number four, to increase the pressure, you could, well, pressure is force divided by area. So you could increase the force, make that bigger, or decrease the area, make that smaller. You could sharpen the object. Uh, number five, to increase the density, you could, well, density is mass divided by volume. So you could make the mass bigger or you could decrease the volume. You know, how do we get a hot air balloon to float? We heat the air up, which makes the mass bigger, which makes the density smaller. Uh, question number six, the maximum buoyant force acting on a submerged object is dependent upon the object's volume because it's the volume of the object that determines how much fluid it can displace. So we're clear here, it's the weight of that fluid that determines what the buoyant force is, but it's the volume of the object that determines how much fluid it can actually displace. Number seven, a fish changes its vertical motion by changing this force. Fish change the buoyant force. 
They can expand and contract their air sacs, which changes the volume, which changes the weight of the fluid displaced. So it changes the buoyant force. Number eight, a submarine changes its vertical motion by changing this force, it would be the weight of the submarine. The submarine has the ability to take water in as ballast. So if it takes water in, it has a greater force to the weight, it moves down. And when it wants to move up, it pressurizes the water and kicks it out. So now the buoyant force would be greater than the sub and it would move up. Uh, the two factors that affect the pressure in the fluid are the fluid's density and the depth in the fluid. So pressure is density times G times H. That's just the constant. So that's the density of the fluid. That's the depth in the fluid. Uh, question number 10, according to the uh, continuity principle, as the area of a container decreases, the velocity increases. So smaller area, faster velocity. Uh, according to Bernoulli's principle, as the velocity of the fluid increases, the internal pressure decreases. So if uh, we can do this, let me show you this. If we can pitch an airplane wing okay, so that the air is coming in like this, if we pitch the airplane wing so that it's like this and we can force the air to go over the top, if the air is going over the top at a faster rate than the air on the bottom, you know, if this is our airplane wing, if we can force the air to go over the top, that means the pressure pushing down is going to be pressure less than the pressure pushing up. Okay. If you multiply that by the area of the wing, it'll tell you what the, the force is, the, the lift force acting on the airplane will be. So uh, number 12, uh, Pascal's principle tells you why a hydraulic system works. Pressure is transmitted undiminished and in all directions throughout the hydraulic fluid. Uh, question number 13, a continuity principle is based upon the law of conservation of matter. What, whatever fluid goes into an area has got to come out. So whatever fluid goes in, it's got to come out, and the volume flow rate has got to stay the same because you can't create it, can't destroy it. Uh, Bernoulli's principle explains why atmospheric pressure drops during a hurricane. You know, why do we board up windows during a hurricane? Well, let's say that's the window. If you, if you get fast-moving air currents around the window, that's actually going to diminish the pressure the gas is pushing on the outside. If you have atmospheric pressure in here, which is pretty big, if you don't board up those windows, it's going to actually make those windows explode. Atmospheric pressure is going to make them burst. So by boarding up the windows, in effect, what you're doing is you're trapping a layer of air between the board and the window, which isn't moving. So the pressures are the same. Uh, question number 15, Archimedes principle is based upon Newton's third law with equal and opposite forces. So if you put an object in a fluid and the object pushes down on the fluid, the fluid pushes up on the object with a force that's equal and opposite. And then question number 16, uh, flotation principle tells us to get equilibrium in a fluid. The object must displace an amount of fluid equal to its own weight. So the principle of flotation is really equilibrium. The upward force, which is the buoyant force, and the downward force, which is the weight of the object, have to be equal. You know, by Archimedes principle, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. So what do all floating objects have to do? They have to displace a weight of fluid equal to their own weight. Uh, application stuff, uh, what happens to the density of a liquid as you go down in depth? For the most part, it stays the same. Liquids are incompressible. Uh, 18, what happens to the density of our atmosphere as you go down or as you go up in altitude? Well, as you go up in altitude, you're getting less deep in the ocean of air, so the density decreases. Uh, gases are compressible. 19, what happens to the pressure exerted on an enclosed fluid anywhere inside the fluid? Uh, it's got to be the same at equal depths. Uh, number 20, what happens to the pressure of the gases on the top of an airplane wing, assuming it's moving? Uh, the pressure on the top is less than the pressure on the bottom because we force the air over on the top to be bigger than the force on the bottom. Uh, 21, what happens to the current in a river when the river narrows? Well, if the river narrows and the area gets smaller, then the velocity has got to get faster. Um, you know, if you ever went whitewater rafting or something like that, it's the narrow part that's fun. That's where you get fast moving currents. 22, what happens to the volume of a water bubble as it rises to the top of boiling water? 
Well, if this is the boiling water and it starts out like this, when it gets up here, it'll be like this. How come? Because uh, as it rises up, the pressure being exerted on the outside of the, the bubble gets progressively less. So that bubble starts like this and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it rises up based upon pressure variations in the inside of the fluid. So a lot of stuff to know. I hope you're getting it. Uh, take a look at this uh, discussion. Take a look at the study guide questions. There's a 10 point quiz that I'd like you to take today. Get that completed in your work for physics. Then today will be done. I uh, hope everybody's doing okay. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow.